Good afternoon, everyone. Settle down, guys. So welcome to the first colloquium of 2019. Uh, I'm delighted for two reasons today. One is, of course, that this colloquium is on a critical public health issue. And we even have some of our uh, students who have studied public health in previous years have found it interesting enough to be here today. The second reason I'm delighted is that the speaker is Dr. Mohan Rao, who happens to be uh, an old friend of mine and also, I have to say, an uh, illustrious uh, colleague. I'll do a very brief introduction because the topic is uh, so interesting that we want to spend as much time on it as we have. Uh, Mohan was uh, the, uh, a professor in uh, JNU before he came here in the Center for Social Medicine and Community Health. Uh, he has studied the issue of surrogacy uh, extensively, written books on it, uh, and I would say he's, um, uh, he is the authority on this topic and has very interesting views uh, that he will share with you shortly. So without further ado, I, uh, I will invite uh, Mohan to come and speak. I don't need to use this. Why did he give it to me there? OK, so I don't need this. Thank you. Hi, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm very grateful to Chandan for uh, inviting me here today. And I thank all of you for coming here to listen to me. I apologize for the fact that my talk rather goes all over, I'm afraid I didn't have enough time to cut it into shape. Given the limitations of time, I will very briefly tell the story of surrogacy in India. And you can't really tell the story of surrogacy in India without referring to perhaps Thailand or Israel. I will then look at how this has been analyzed. There's been quite a bit of work done. Given how sexy the issue is and how much media attention it has received, more anthropological time has been spent on this issue than on maternal deaths in India. And I think there's some serious problem here. But looking at IVF or surrogacy in themselves is not enough. We have to connect these phenomena to a global bioeconomy, and that is what I will spend most of my time doing. The large majority of people supporting commercial surrogacy, doctors involved, organizations like FOGSI, Federation of Obstetricians and Gynecologists Society in India, institutions like FICI, libertarian feminists, and indeed some commercial surrogates mobilized by the Indian Society for Assisted Reproduction, that's called ISAR, use the argument of reproductive choice and agency while talking about surrogacy. The motivations of institutions like Foxy and Fiki are very clear. But that feminists still use the argument of choice is disturbing. Women of color rejected ideas of reproductive choice, arguing instead for the concept of reproductive justice sometime in the 1970s. This concept has received little attention in India, possibly because the history of slavery and reproductive slavery in the country has been swept under the carpet. When Indians think of slavery, they think only of the Atlantic slave slavery. Looking at the issue of commercial surrogacy through the lens of reproductive justice then lends an entirely different policy prescription. I'll begin with a newspaper story. The Indian Express, Coimbatore of 9th January 2014, carried the tragic story of Shakuntala, a 27-year-old scheduled tribe woman making a dying declaration at the Salem District Hospital where she was admitted after being attacked by her husband, Navaraj, 31 years old, at Kamrapalyam. Married in 2006, she had been forced to donate her kidneys barely three months after her marriage at a hospital in Coimbatore. She had been paid rupees one lakh for the kidney. She had also been forced to be a surrogate mother earlier. She had been forced to donate over 
18 times, 18 times in hospitals in Valapadi, Salem, and Coimbatore. She does not know how many eggs were harvested every time. She'd been paid between 18,000 rupees to 30,000 rupees each time her eggs were harvested. The money was received by her husband and mother-in-law. Her husband was forcing her to go, in th go through surrogacy once again when she ran away from home with her five-year-old daughter and took refuge with a friend, Selby, a CPIML activist. It was at Selby's house that Navraj attacked her fatally. I sent this news report sent to me by Kavita Krishnan, since I was then a member of the National Commission on Population, to the National Human Rights Commission to take Suomoto action, but was met with stunning silence. Now, this is the third party administrator I interviewed. He said to me, we give her the surrogate, an identity, get her a voter's ID card, a bank account, and teach her how to use it. We deposit the money in installments directly into her account so that her husband does not get it. She gets more money than she can ever earn in her life. Surrogacy is enriching and empowering. We have, of course, to make sense of both these stories. India emerged as a leading hub of commercial surrogacy over more than two decades. This was policy-led as the government, through a series of measures, encouraged the growth of health tourism and reproductive health tourism. Not having precise figures, commercial surrogacy was thought to generate US dollars 2.3 billion annually by 2012, with the ICMR predicting its growth into a 6 billion per year industry by 2020. The ICMR estimated in 2010 that there were over 3,000 IVF surrogacy clinics in the country, with only 365 of them registered with the ICMR. The Indian Society for Assisted Reproduction had a membership of more than 600. What is interesting is that these clinics have now moved to smaller cities and towns to exploit the market in these areas, and indeed to create markets. India has emerged as a center for destination for people wishing both to have assisted reproduction and for surrogacy. The surrogacy business alone was said to be worth $445 million. The cost of hiring a surrogate in India ranged from 6,000 to 8,000 $6, $8, US as against $80,000 in the U USA. That's it's, it's a tenth cheaper. Although there are wide variation, the cost of IVF in India is about $500 US for each cycle compared to $5,000 in the USA. What is also important to bear in mind is that the ART industry also offers a regular supply of spare over to another industry, namely the stem cell industry, also unregulated in India. India has announced a public-private partnership with three European pharmaceutical companies and the British government for stem cell research. Now this is very interesting because each time a Republican government comes to power in the United States, they ban stem cell research. And that case, India then has a bigger market uh, to exploit. In 2009, partly in response to the baby manji case, partly in response to the fact that the surrogacy industry had really taken off with no regulation, the Law Commission had recommended the need to, I quote, adopt a pragmatic approach by legalizing altruistic surrogacy arrangements and prohibit commercial ones. In terms of regulation, broadly two phases have been identified by scholars. The first phase in which everything went and you had a flood of foreign heterosexual and gay couples rushing into India to hire commercial surrogates. Initially, since there was no law, all commercial surrogacy was legal and this was codified in the ART Regulation Bill 2010. It was in the ART Regulation Bill 2012 that foreign gay couples were banned from hiring surrogates in India, and the traffic then shifted to Nepal. Nepal banned Nepali women from being hired as surrogates, but permitted foreign women, mainly from India and Bangladesh, to move to Kathmandu to be hired as surrogates. There is an iconic photograph after the devastating earthquake of 2015, the government of Israel arranged for an El Al flight to bring back the Israeli gay couples with their babies from Kathmandu. The surrogate mothers were left to fend for themselves. If you're interested, I'll later talk about how Israel figures in this, because Israel is spending a lot of money uh, on a PR exercise known as pinkwashing. 
Israel supports the LGBT pride movement in Los Angeles. It supports the LGBT pride movement uh, in London, both of which prohibit Palestinian. Uh, anyway, we can talk about it later if there's time. Yeah. After international uproar over two scandals, Thailand banned commercial surrogacy in February 2015. The first scandal involved an Australian couple hiring a Thai surrogate. The surrogate gave birth to twins, a boy and a girl. The boy, baby Gami, had Down syndrome and a congenital heart condition and was not accepted by the commissioning couple who took the baby girl with them. International outrage was also due to the fact that the commissioning father had just served a prison term for child sexual abuse. The second scandal was a discovery in 2014 that a Japanese billionaire businessman, Mr. Mitsutake Shigeta, had hired 13 Thai surrogates who were carrying embryos fertilized by him with donor eggs. Mr. Shigeta had taken back earlier to Japan four children born through Thai surrogates. He had also two children born to surrogates in Cambodia. Mr. Shigeta argued that he had a vast business empire and he believed that only his line could head these various businesses. The Thai ban on commercial surrogacy, of course, increased the demand in India. But in 2014, the government of India, through the ART Regulation Bill 2014, banned foreign nationals from hiring commercial surrogates in India and revoked the provision of a surrogacy visa. This was followed by the Surrogacy Regulation Bill 2016 that banned all commercial surrogacy. This was partly due to the Baby Manji case and partly due to the German Jan Balas case. It was also due to a PIL filed by a lawyer, Jayesh Srivad, in 2015 in the Supreme Court, calling for a com complete ban on commercial surrogacy, arguing that it leads to the commodification and exploitation of women. This is the only time that I've heard these words being used. There has been one death to a surrogate mother, which has caught media, media attention. There's been another death of an egg donor in Delhi, Sherpa. Shakuntala's death is, of course, not included here for the press in Delhi, routinely ignores everything not from the Hindi Hindu heartland. The anthropologist Lachlan Jain was herself an egg donor on two occasions for her surrogate partner. In her terrifyingly brave book, Cancer is Us, Jane traces how she discovered she had breast cancer as a result of egg donation. Looking at the links between egg harvesting and subsequently cancer, she finds a statistically significant link. In India, of course, we do not follow, do follow up on any women who have donated eggs or been surrogates. In addition, it is also known that babies born through surrogacy have a high prevalence of congenital malformations. We also need to follow up these bodies for babies for cancer in later life. The 2016 bill met with a great deal of opposition from the reproductive industry and was referred to a parliamentary standing committee that struck down the ban on commercial surrogacy, arguing instead for what was called compensated surrogacy, the UK model. Ignoring the recommendations of the Parliamentary Standing Committee, the government passed the Surrogacy Regulation Bill 2018 that banned all commercial surrogacy. I'm not really clear what motivated this law. I interviewed members of the Parliamentary Standing Committee and almost all of them did not want this kind of law. Patriarchy and caste endogamy are, of course, central to RSS thinking. Was the government then protecting Hindu women? Some years back, the iconic film actor Amir Khan and his wife Kiran Rao put forth a statement in newspapers announcing the birth of their genetic child, Azad, through surrogacy. They thanked God, they thanked their doctors, they thanked science, they thanked technology, they thanked family, they thanked friends. Missing here was possibly the most important actor in this drama, the surrogate. This was perhaps bec because she had been paid for and no further obligations ensued. This echoed the statement by Nicole Kidman, completely obliterating the surrogate mother. Was this done for legal reasons? I don't know. In the UK, for example, the surrogate mother is legally recognized as the mother, irrespective of the genetic origins of the baby. There is an irony here that has been noticed before. The surrogate mother literature tells us even is, even in the most commercial of transactions, being told she's doing what only God on earth can do, gift precious life to couples who cannot bear a child. 
Yet clearly, for womb-hiring couples such as Khan Rao or the couple from Texas in a film called Made in India, this is a commercial relationship. Altruism is here not in an uneasy, unexamined relationship with commodification. On the contrary, commodification is the winner. Clearly, you can be asked to return a gift. You cannot be asked to return something you have bought. Given the media hype and the sexiness of the issues that have been raised, there has been some scholarly research around the issues raised by ART and surrogacy. Most scholars have pointed out to the fact that given the highly unregulated nature of medical care in the country, there is a substantial amount of unethical practices involved and that the ICMR guidelines were being implemented more in the breach than otherwise. Others have pointed to the vulnerabilities of the women involved, driven as they are by quotidian economic concerns to offer up their bodies for exploitation. Indeed, it has been cogently argued that the draft bill read to, sorry, set to regulate the ART industry was drafted at the behest of the very industry it seeks to regulate, and was meant not so much to offer protection to the women's surrogates as to the industry. Scholars have examined various aspects of patriarchy that underlie the seemingly seamless acceptance of this practice in India. I interviewed the director of ICMR then, who had drafted these laws, and he said, Indians accept it, you know, because it's there in the Ramayana, it's there in the Mahabharata. So surrogacy is part of what he says, Indian heritage. So I pointed out it's there in the Bible also, but he said that our epics are older. What was also clear was that surrogacy was now an industry involving a network of actors and agencies from the global to the local. Yet it is surprising that none of these critiques call for rethinking the issue towards a ban on all but commercial altruistic surrogacy. Okay, now I go into the next part of the paper. While the visibility and valorization of women's reproductive labor was something that came to be recognized reluctantly and with hesitation with the second wave of feminism, what is not adequately recognized or theorized is the concept of surplus reproductive labor. This is surprising given the fact that advances in life sciences over the last 20 odd years has commercialized all aspects of what has been called the global bioeconomy. As Waldby and Cooper I argue, I quote, Women constitute the primary tissue donors in the new stem cell industries, which require high volumes of human embryos, oocytes, fetal tissue, and umbilical cord blood. These industries rely on maternal embryonic nexus as a generative site. In the West, these are obtained as surplus, that is, spare embryos or waste, umbilical cord afterbirth, poor quality oocytes, etc whose regenerative capacity cannot or should not be withheld from others who might potentially benefit. In other places, countries such as India, China, and much of the countries of Eastern Europe, these are frankly transactional relations. The issue that I raise is whether we recognize this as exploitative and the appropriation of surplus labor with some special characteristics, and as a result, evolve a different set of policy implications. One reason that women's labor was not recognized as such, especially in the reproduction of the household economy, was precisely because women were seen as altricial above all. This has a long tradition in Western law, going back to the Greek states. Women were not slaves, but neither were they fully embodied citizens. All modern concepts of self, of objects, and of ourselves as objects are derived from this frame of reference. Selfless women's labor in the care and maintenance of the household was seen as love or a gift or a don donation, something not to be vulgarized by market considerations. It is therefore not at all surprising that the same considerations accrue to women's reproductive labor literally. That is, they donate what is waste to them so that others unknown may benefit. As Dickinson has argued, I quote, the products of women's bodies are commodified gaining tremendously in value, but women's contribution to that value is not recognized in the marketplace because it is viewed under the same rubric as home production. What is not remarked upon simultaneously it is, that, is that on these donations rests a transnational industry 
making profits, selling hype and hope in an increasingly speculative market, selling futures. You know, in the case of this industry, this is not just a metaphorical speculation. It is literal speculation. Sexton has characterized this transnational business as selling speculative promissory notes of hope. In the same vein, Hodges characterizes the global bioeconomy bio as venture capital-led selling of fantasy. This global industry, dominated by transnational corporations, is said to be worth $176 billion in the USA and $3.23 trillion in the EU. ARTs and surrogacy are only a small but essential part of this massive industry, indeed its heart. It is essential because the raw materials for this global bioeconomy can only come from women's bodies. But values are added more distally in the chain. It needs hardly be added that the more distally we proceed from the female body, body not only are more values being added, but this is largely a male industry comprising scientists in the life sciences who obtain patents on gifts donated by women venture capital and biotech firms who to obtain patents sold to them by scientists and profits from the sale of patents and firms with patents. Thompson has argued that in the biomedical mode of reproduction, I quote, reproduction is made productive in an industrial sense with its product being standardized molecular entities like clones and cell lines. Franklin and Locke in their analysis of the contemporary globalized life sciences place reproduction in the center of a capitalized biosciences as the primary generator of wealth and values. This needs to be repeatedly emphasized as value is created and commoditized based on the alienated and estranged labor of women. This is needed, it is argued, for otherwise female labor and its products are invisible. Even while these products are sold and exchange values realized, women's labor itself is seen as belonging to the domain of altruism and gift. As in the case of reproduction of the family, the biotech industry too uses the sleight of hand. That is, that women's donation of oocytes, etc., is beyond transactional relations of commerce. Dickinson notes that the new enclosures of the genetic commons raises concerns and debates when men are the sources of tissues such as cell lines. This has been hotly contested in the courts in USA. This is not the case when women are, in a sense, mined, since women's bodies are naturally giftable. She, however, warns that with the new, warns that with the new global bioeconomy, both men's and women's bodies stand objectified and commoditized. She characterizes this as the feminization of male bodies. Waldby and Cooper argue that today, I quote, reproduction is denationalized and exposed to global labor markets. Thus, Eastern European women, along with providing women in prostitution, also have emerged as major sellers of oocytes solicited by pr uh, private transnational IVF clinics. Indeed, it has been documented that women in Ukraine in particular were given a thousand pounds for their aborted fetuses subsequently sold to cosmetic clinics and spas. The same source also supplies material for stem cell research and treatment. There's a global trade in blood, cell lines, placentas, embryonic stem cells, embryos, and so on. Madras is a major exporter of, exporter of placentas in India. Many of these cell lines are, of course, patented both by individual scientists in universities, but more importantly, by biotech firms, global in nature. While in the Marxist analysis of labor, a laborer produces a surplus that is realized when a commodity is sold, that is, after it is alienated from him, in reproductive labor too, can we not argue that a surplus is realized when the product is commoditized, either as a stem cell, cell line, regenerative treatment, or indeed a baby that is created for surrogacy. As surplus labor is congealed into the commodity, surplus accrues to the owner of the means of production at the point the commodity is sold. In other words, labor that occurred earlier in time is realized as surplus later in time. We see the same occurring with respect to reproductive labor too, 
except that in some of these cases, these go on endlessly into the future. As Kaushik Sundarajan has argued, I quote, it is not labor but life itself which becomes the locus of value in biocapital, with health becoming the index of life rather than the facilitator of labor. Oliver argues that while Marx's analysis of estranged labor, I quote, applies only metaphorically to other kinds of labor, it applies literally to surrogacy. In the, in the, I quote, in the case of surrogacy, the product is not part of the inorganic body of nature, rather the product, the child, is itself an organic body created out of another organic body. The surrogate then is doubly estranged. She's estranged from her organic body and the body of her child. Her freedom is an illusion created by estranged labor. While commercial surrogacy is banned in most countries of Europe, France consistently rejects the commodification of any part of the body. Again, this goes back to the concept of res nullius in Roman law. Just as you cannot sell blood, so you cannot sell sperm, ova, or indeed cell lines. The body is not a tool, it is not yours to sell. This is largely derived from an ancient Roman law, res nullius. The French National Ethics Committee clearly states, I quote, the human genome should not be used for commercial purposes. The human body should not be used for commercial purposes. The human body or one of its components cannot be the object of contracts. This has profound implications for discussions on property rights and patents on biological products at the WTO. No consensus has been arrived at then. 14 out of 15 EU states have made it illegal for their citizens to buy body parts from each other. But only one state, Germany, forbids its citizens from body shopping, this is the phrase used in other countries, thus boosting international demand. Clearly, there is more than hypocrisy here, one law for their own citizens and another for the rest of the world. Interestingly, in the notorious baby M judgment, uh, this involved a baby created through surrogacy in New York. Uh, the sperm came from the father, commissioning father. The egg was from the commissioning mother. Uh, the surrogate did not contribute anything to it. Which controversially, sorry. The sperm came from the commissioning father. The egg came from the surrogate mother. Okay in baby M case. Now, the Su New York Supreme Court controversially awarded the baby to the genetic father rather, to the ge rather than to the genetic and gestational surrogate mother, and but at the same time it argued that surrogacy contracts were illegal and unenforceable. The reason they the child was awarded, baby M was given to the father, <coughs> was awarded to the contracting couple, the egg buyer and womb hirers, despite the infirmity, indeed illegality of the contract, because the contracting couple, I quote, afforded a better life for the baby than her genetic and gestational mother. So thus do class and race intertwine. In this case, the surrogate mother was black, even as laws strengthen patriarchy. It is often argued that women are exercising agency when they choose to become surrogates, that they are exercising reproductive choice. And this is an argument made extensively by libertarian feminists in India. Three years back, at a magnificent festschrift to Professor Betsy Hartman, and I think the title of her author of the classic, Reproductive Rights and Wrongs, I was confronted by Professor Loretta Ross, a uh, black feminist. She lashed out at me saying, I quote, you feminists in India are, and she used a dirty word which I don't want to repeat. When you talk of surrogacy, you either talk of rights or choice or pragmatism. It gives these people some money, you say, or agency. Upper caste feminists have no understanding, she said, of reproductive slavery that we blacks have, or Dalits have. It is in our collective history. They talk of rights, but have no idea of justice. I'm quoting Loretta Ross. 
I have not been able to find literature from Dalit feminists on this issue in India, perhaps because Dalits are not wanted as surrogates. But Dalit feminist Cynthia Stephen in a personal conversation stated that she supported Ross's view. Women of color in the USA have for a long time rejected the notion of re reproductive choice, arguing that this is a bourgeois concept, indeed a white woman's concept. Angela Davis pointed out in 1976 that a quarter of all Native American women and black women were sterilized without their consent. Angela Davis also pointed out that the pill which had liberated white women had been tested on the bodies of black women when they were unsafe. Indeed, that white women's reproductive rights had been won on the backs of reproductive wrongs on women of color subjected to reproductive st slavery and sterilization abuse. Reproductive justice in this view can only come ensconced in political, economic, and social rights. The Lockean idea of choice and contract applies only to people who are equal. When you have a, when you have a situation of structural inequality, that notion does not make sense. This was what was used in the Baby M judgment that ruled that surrogacy contracts were not valid. We might also note that there is a Paris Declaration of European Feminists calling for a ban on all surrogacy, including altruistic surrogacy. There has also been a CEDAW declaration that essentially says surrogacy is violence against women and similarly calls for a ban. Interestingly, I have just discovered that there is now a group of children in the United States born through surrogacy who've reached 20, 21 years of age. And they're all coming together uh, in what is called a movement. And this movement is demanding for a ban on surrogacy in the United States. And what struck me was the language they, they have used. And it seems to me that they're almost using the language of caste society because they said they felt polluted the children who are born through surrogacy. We must note that these policy prescriptions do not emanate from the concept of reproductive choice, but reproductive justice. Thank you. So I think now uh, we can open up uh, the session for questions. Please raise your hands if you have a question. Yeah. Or comments, yes, quite right. Uh, could you talk of that Israeli digression that you made? Okay. Uh, Israel is, as you know, an apartheid state, acutely conscious of the fact that uh, they're living in what they call a time bomb. Uh, birth rates among Jews has gone down. Uh, Palestinians continue to have a higher birth rate. And so they're going out of the way to induce Jewish women to have more children. So Jewish women in Israel, not Palestinian women who are citizens of Israel will get surrogacy if they're married and so on. Uh, the state subsidizes. Um, since they follow religious laws, they do not allow gays to hire surrogates in Israel. But as part of what they call, what has been called homo-nationalism, they have no qualms about permitting gay couples going abroad as reproductive tourists. And so they would come to India and they still go to Nepal and so on, many countries. Now, this is because uh, Israel is, sees itself as a, a homophiliac nation in a sea of Arab homophobia. And so they go 
out of the way as cultivating themselves as uh, homophiliac countries. Um, I forget the names involved. I'll give you one example. Uh, Chelsea Manning. Uh, you know who Chelsea Manning is? Hmm? Yeah. When she was in prison, she was asked to be the uh, leader of the last Los Angeles Gay Pride, but obviously she was in prison, and uh, she was not. Al she could not have participated. So she nominated this line of the American left, this old man who must be in his 90s. Uh, what's his name? Tree, do you remember? This, anyway, this is his, he's an activist from the anti-Vietnam War movement and the uh, Iraq War movement, etc. Very well-known man whose name skips my mind. And he agreed, he agreed. This man is Jewish but he belongs to a small group of Jews against Zionism. So he was not allowed to take Chelsea Manning's place. So uh, in 2015, I think the Delhi Gay Pride was addressed by a counselor from the Israeli embassy. So the links between the government of Israel and the LGBT movement are fairly strong. And there's a lot of funding which comes from Israel. They do a very peculiar thing. A Shabbat house in Bombay used to do it. Uh, Jewishness is inherited through the mother. So what do you do when a Jewish gay couple, uh, they hire an egg, obviously. They buy an egg. And the going rate for a Jewish, blonde, blue-eyed, Harvard, or something is 50,000 US dollars. Okay? So, what would happen would be a gay couple, if they wanted such a Jewish egg, would buy this egg in Harvard, bring the egg to Bombay, fertilize it with one of the men's sperm, and insert it into an Indian surrogate mother. But uh, before they do that, they would have a rabbi come from Shabbat house, convert the egg into a Jewish egg, and put it in into the uterus. Recently, I also came across the fact that uh, uh, this is a fascinating uh, essay by an anthropologist who's looking at reproduction in Israel. You have the case of a Palestinian woman who is being harvested for eggs, and they take out 26 eggs from her. And the point is, no Jewish woman wants to have them because they say these are Muslim eggs. I want to make a comment. So I think a solution to the entire scenario can be if we move towards adoption. But then I think people would not be willing to adopt adoption thing is because again there is intersectionality of the people who would actually be orphans. So uh, these will be like underprivileged people who will be coming from lower caste families. And since you will actually not be sure of their background, then you will not be willing to accept them in your families. So if a sort of atmosphere is created that you know people are willing to uh, accept adopted children then i think we can move away from the need for surrogacy at all especially considering when you know we are having a lot of population problems so yeah that's what i think i think it is important to make uh, adoption more easy but uh, those people who are going in for surrogacy are not those who would consider adoption. They want their own lives, yeah, right. Ge so genetic. So something, you know, this kind of a value that we are able to inculcate over time, that, you know, we are more accepting towards other people in the society that we are, you know, wanting to take them as part of our family, as children, I think that can make a change in the movement. How are the laws across the different uh, states in India? Like, 
you know, does, say for example, West Bengal, does it have the same law? Act that no state it? has laws on this. This is only centrally regulated. It's only in the United States, it's a, uh, each state has its own law. Uh, some states ban commercial surrogacy, others don't. So in the United States, it's a very confusing picture in terms of case laws. You have the baby M case where the baby was awarded to the contracting couple. But you also have several cases in California recognizes the surrogate mother as a natural mother, irrespective of the genetic relationship with the baby. So it varies from state to state in this country. What I find also striking is I recently read this book by Peter Frankopan called The Silk Roads, the, old silk, the older book. And he's talking about the slave trade and how the slave trade was so essential to uh, the Renaissance in Europe. And when he's talking about the slave trade, and it took me by surprise because I'd also forgotten, the slave trade he's referring to are slaves from Georgia, from Ukraine, Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, and they're all traded in what are the country, cities of the Renaissance really, primarily uh, Florence, Venice, University of Leiden is built on slave money. It was one of the first universities to come. Now it is these same countries, those same countries, which are now contributing to this global bioeconomy in terms of women's body parts. I think that's striking. For 400 years, nothing seems to have changed there in terms of the global bioeconomy is concerned. Thank you for discussing different perspectives around reproductive justice and rights. Uh, I was just wondering if you can talk a little bit about the surrogacy bill which was passed recently in Lok Sabha and also how it bans commercial surrogacy at the same time promoting uh, surrogacy through a close relative, al altruistic surrogacy in pregnancy, and how it can also be a form of exploitation at the same time. So if you can talk a little bit about that. As I said, I haven't really understood why this ban on commercial surrogacy uh, was the final bill passed. I interviewed members of the Parliamentary Standing Committee, which was discussing the bill that had been mooted in Parliament, except for Lalita Kumaramangalam, who was the NCW chairperson at that time when the bill was drafted. Not one of the MPs across party lines wanted a ban on commercial surrogacy they were mooting for something known as the compensated surrogacy, which is what you could have in UK. So when this bill was finally passed in Parliament in December, I was completely taken aback because the bill now says a ban on commercial surrogacy. And in fact, the Parliamentary Standing Committee report notes how altruistic surrogacy can, in the Indian context, be deeply exploitative. Okay. And so they're, they're very cautious about recommending this. And yet the final bill, when it comes, only recognizes altruistic surrogacy and calls for a complete ban on commercial surrogacy. I haven't understood, as I said, why this is so. Uh, I was told by one of the members of the Parliamentary Standing Committee that Sushma Swaraj was for a ban. And uh, she was arguing that outsiders are coming and our women are being exploited. I suspect that this must have been the overwhelming feeling in Parliament when they accepted this complete ban on commercial surrogacy. What do you think? So, like even at the same time, two more bills were passed, the transgenders bill and anti-trafficking bill. So this happened in a series of events and it was though, although they were like even the activists and organizations were completely against uh, the transgenders bill as well and the surrogacy bill saying how exploitative it is but even yeah like how did this happen when uh, what is also interesting is in when the parliamentary standing committee called for witnesses uh, and they took testimonies except for one journalist pinky virani all other people who testified in front of the Parliamentary Standing Committee were for no ban on surrogacy. 
They wanted just regulation. Uh, and, and it's who are the people who went and gave, of course, ICER was there, FICI was there, CII was there, HOGC was there, the Federation, what is that, Indian Society for Assisted Reproduction, and some surrogates who claim that this benefited them. Actually, in my, my research, foreign couples were paying something like 12 lakhs uh, for a baby, that is for one. The surrogate mother would get maximum three lakhs. The hospital package would cost about three lakhs. Nobody was able to explain where the other six lakhs disappeared. M I, my suspicion is that it went to a third party administrator. So there's a lot of gray areas here as far as money is concerned. And three lakhs is, I mean, the third party administrator says, well, it's more than she would have ever earned in her life. But no, a lot of research points out that this money does not last very much. Mostly they're in debt for medical reasons, and they perhaps put up a roof over their head, and that's it, it's over before they know it. You know, but you can't use that to justify something like this because but you can, in the same way, also justify sale of kidneys. No? And that has worked. The ban on commercial sales of kidneys has worked. People who are s saying, don't ban surrogacy, kept saying, oh, but it will go underground. It can't go underground. The doctors who are responsible are liable. so much for this very engaging and important um, um, talk. So uh, what I found particularly interesting was the fact that you contextualize surrogacy within global capitalist movements and also just um, its relationship to so many other countries and, and the link to um, slavery as well. So I was curious to know if you feel that there should be an international kind of response or international human rights law response to this and would that at all be effective? See, surrogacy you need more or less, it's, there's a unanimity that it's, as I said, in most countries it's not accepted. Most countries ban surrogacy. What do you do about the fact that the fastest growing industry in the health sector is not your pharmaceutical sector but your bioeconomy? And the bioeconomy is growing not because of any products that they've brought to the market. There have been hardly any products that have come to the market. They are growing because it is, as I said, it is venture capital led speculative finance. What is happening is that people are saying, okay, five years down the line, there's going to be this drug which is going to cure this kind of cancer. And that you take a patent on that. And this cancer line could have come from a patient, it would have come from somebody else. But you get a patent on it, your company makes money, and then you sell it to somebody else. And then this kind of speculative selling and buying, mergers and so on, that is what, it's, it's, a, it's a huge bubble of money, huge amounts of money there. And if a tenth of that had been used for public health, health would have been better for all of us, for everybody in the world. But the financialization of biology, how do you deal with that? And that is something that you'll have to negotiate at the WTO. And I don't know how many countries can or have the political will to take on the, these companies. They're all trying to get these companies to invest in them. A lot of money was coming into India as long as surrogacy was there. We'll have to think of how do you deal with this. Yeah. Uh, maybe this is well known, but can you uh, elaborate on the risks uh, surrogate mother goes through? Apart from the most normal risk of any pregnancy, the biggest risk seems to be the fact that 
when the surrogate's mother is being primed uh, through hormones. And uh, at least 10 days of intense hormonal stimulation before the egg is implanted in it. It is this hormonal, uh, what, what should I say, it's a storm, it's a hormonal storm. It is this which leads to cancers later in the surrogate's life. So cancer and surrogate being uh, primed with hormones are very, very closely linked. Uh, there are other kinds of things that I, are associations uh, but have not been causally established because these are all things where you have to follow up over a large period of time, a large sample. But the link between cancer, breast cancer, and egg donation, uh, ovarian stimulation, that is so strong that it has already been established. Lachlan Jane's book is a wonderful book to read. She's half Indian, her father's uh, Indian. Uh, she's a Canadian, she's a professor of anthropology, I think at Columbia University. Her book is called Cancer is Us. And uh, yeah, very interesting things she has to say about the cancer industry and the way public health is looking at cancer and she's making quite an interesting critique of Siddharth Mukherjee's work and he's given her a beautiful quote for her book. Uh, she has some very interesting insights. For example, the cancer prevention NGO, I think it's called Pink Ribbons. The biggest contributor to their campaign is the card company Audi, which is bribing American senators and House of Representatives to bring down air quality standards. So on the one hand, uh, you're doing all this, you know, giving money to, for the prevention of cancer. And on the other hand, you're, bring, you know, you're bribing senators to say bring down air quality standards so you can sell more cars. about that uh, congenital diseased child and the Down syndrome child born to the Thai mother, Thai surrogate mother. So what is the legal immunity such commercial mo surrogate mothers have around the world, sir? It, it depends. Uh, in the Indian bill, it says the parents cannot refuse a child. But if they do, what? who's going to do what? I'm not aware of ILO doing the, taking a stand on this at all. There's been no Why would ILO take a stand on it? No, uh, not you, anybody for ILO. ILO, ILO. Okay. International Labor Organization. Yeah. Because again, if, if we look at surrogacy, uh, it is a service. Yeah, some kind of a labor, right? Uh, so I mean, again, uh, it totally depends. organization would even uh, would like to even include it don't you think the more relevant organization which perhaps should have taken a position should have been WHO no. because they're concerned with maternal health and child health Definitely. they have not they have not taken a position on it it's this other organizations like CEDAW and so on which have taken a position CEDAW is not an NGO. CEDAW is an inter-country. I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of ILO taking any stand on it. Which is, um, just going back to the Indian uh, law now, and what you said about I don't know why they banned it and people were in favor of regulation, but 
in India, we have such a dismal record of actually um, uh, enforcing regulations. And actually, from what you yourself said, been more successful with bans. So, um, I mean, in that context, uh, would you still say that uh, it is possible for us to have a regulated uh, sort of market uh, in surrogacy uh, without it um, being subject to the kind of abuse and misuse that is happening even today? See, I think people who said, you know, Naina Patel, the queen of uh, surrogacy in India, she's a, she's the one who keeps saying regulation. Re For them, regulation mean, meant let it be as it is. They're not serious about regulating. What they were concerned about is uh, some of the doctors who are good doctors in the field are really concerned about the fact that India's reputation is suffering because of the very high failure rates in India. Okay, we have very few embryologists who will transfer the embryo. So you have a situation today where you have, I think about six or 10 embryologists in India who are, well, the way the situation operates is say you get together 10 nursing home owners in a place like Agra. Now each of them has two to three patients that they have primed for IVF. And so you, they're fixing it up so that these 10 doctors and their two to three patients, that is about 30 patients, all ovulate around the same day, okay? Then the embryologist will fly in from Delhi, do the embryo transfers and fly back in the evening. The next day he would be going to Sri Lanka, the next day he would be going to Kathmandu because there were so few of them. And so the failure rates were very high. And so these doctors who were concerned about regulation were concerned about how India's reputation was taking a beating because it was not a very successful in terms of success rates. But others were talking, when they spoke of regulation, they just meant, let us continue the way we are. They were very happy with the way things were. I can only share this with you informally because I know of a couple, American citizens, uh, the woman is, has gone to Naina Patel recently after the ban on Americans or foreigners coming here. And uh, Naina said, do you have a sister or somebody, you bring your sister here. And so the sister is the altruistic surrogate, but they've actually hired a surrogate. So legally it's the sister who's carrying the baby, but she's not. The rates have gone up. Around everything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just a quick question on the on the movement in the U.S. by children of surrogate mothers asking that it not be allowed to continue. Uh, what what were their um, justifications? Actually, it was all, it's from what they uh, there were two very, very long pieces on this in the New York Times. Uh, these are both journalistic accounts that I read. The, what struck me was this, that they're using the word of language of purity and pollution. They felt they are sullied. So they, from what I could gather from all their testimonies, that they felt that childbirth is something perhaps sacred, or pure, God knows. This is the impression that I got from them. But the word they use is sullied. It's very strange. Uh, doing something sim similar, although, I mean, of course, it's not, it, I mean, a biological process which ends in a child who's going to be reared by somebody other than the biological mother, right? But
but I have not heard uh, that same You know, language. but there's something very peculiar going on. Why should Kanye West and Kim Kardashian go in for a fourth child by surrogacy? What are they trying to prove? I mean, they've got now a biological child they wanted, they've got two, and now they've gone in for a fourth child. It's, it's, is it just consumption? But Kanye West is crazy, you know that. Yeah. <laughs> And Nicole Kidman also has had three. Yeah. So you spoke about reproductive choice and reproductive justice. So can you elaborate a little more on that? Okay. Uh, This goes back in, in particular to the United States and uh, the struggle women in the United States have waged for the right to abortion. Uh, even now in the United States, it's deeply contested and when in the Roe versus Wade judgment, women were permitted abortions in the United States, it was not permitted as a reproductive right it was not permitted for on the grounds of women's health. It was permitted on the grounds of privacy, which is very strange, which is very strange. Uh, so the women's movement in the West has made the argument, you must have read our bodies, ourselves, etc. We own our bodies, so what's going to happen to us? It is our choice. So we will decide. So this whole idea of reproductive choice became central to the struggle for the right to abortion and later still for the right to contraception. In the United States, under the Comstock law, uh, access to contraception was also limited. And although contraception became available, it was not legally available for some time. I think the Comstock law got only repealed in 1962. I'm not quite sure about that date. So there too, it was a question of rights. The emphasis was on reproductive rights, right to access contraception. And so when the pill entered the market, it was so liberatory for them that you didn't have to be afraid of getting pregnant and so on. Uh, it was at that point in time that Angela Davis pointed out that it might be choice for you, white women, but black women were never given a choice. A quarter of all black women had been sterilized for eugenic reasons or for other reasons. Uh, black women had no choice when they were put on trials with the drugs. So she pointed out that what was called reproductive rights for white women came with reproductive wrongs on the bodies of black women and women of color. And so she said, this concept of rights that you're talking of is a concept which is an abstraction for most women who are, who live struggling with lives of poverty. So unless we are able to exercise social rights, economic rights, health rights, to talk of reproductive rights in, is an abstraction, it doesn't make sense. Reproductive rights can only come to us when there is social, economic, and political rights. So this is what they term the movement for social justice. And actually, at Cairo, uh, third world women, women from the South, also took up this issue of reproductive justice. They pointed out at, at the Cairo conference that in a world which is so unequal, where a small section of the world's population is getting richer and richer and the vast majority of the world is getting not rich, getting poorer in comparative terms, the idea of 
reproductive rights, they said is, it doesn't make sense. So the women of the South at Cairo argued that you need to have a more equal world before third world women could be asked to take up contraception. So it's constantly been there, this idea between rights and justice. There is this uh, ideological divide, right, between the conservatives and the liberals, the libertarians, and so on and so forth. I'm wondering in India, uh, is there a sharp uh, distinction between different religious groups on the issue of surrogacy? Do they have differences based on that or differences based on political ideology? What is it that uh, drives the political, con uh, I mean, drives the conversation? No, there are different uh, uh, things here. My own view is that in 1971, when the MPP bill was passed, uh, there was not one squeak of resistance except from the Shankaracharya of Puri, uh, who was a known RSS man. And much before uh, all this uh, thing about Muslim rates of population, et cetera, he made the argument in 1971 that Hindus will disproportionately use abortion and that their birth rates will decline more, Muslims will not use abortion, and their birth rates will go up higher. This is an argument that was made in 1971. In other words, in a country which was popularly called an essentially religious country, there was no religious opposition to abortion from no one, from no group. Today, that is not the case. I think today there exists an anti-abortion sentiment in the country, and that came to light during the Chandigarh Narini Ketan case. Uh, you know about the Chandigarh Narini Ketan case. So the, and the court in that case, the Supreme Court then, uh, came up with a very strange argument which said that this woman is healthy, so she, her pregnancy should continue. And uh, she gave birth to a baby, and the baby was taken up by Hindu groups for adoption. So the idea that there is moral danger stalking, especially Hindu girls, is there now, and this is what is feeding into ideas of love jihad and so on. The moral policing of women's sexuality is getting s stronger and stronger, I think. Or you wouldn't have had this ridiculous Supreme Court judgment on Hadia. My student uh, did a PhD interviewing something like 52 surrogates, and uh, quite a few of them were Muslims. And uh, interestingly, I mean, your heart breaks when you hear testimonies like this, because they're saying, my husband got killed in 2002 in Gujarat. So who's going to help me take care of my children? And she says, I know it is haram, but I have to do this. According to my students' uh, interviews with the commissioning couple, they preferred some Muslims because they are fairer. All kinds of things here. That is, of course, they want the Ashrafi Muslims. I think that's it. Thank you.
thank you, owen, thank you.